done yet. And so like the uh, the corporate site has not caught on to that yet. And like I, I'm not sure why, because now they don't have to pay for packaging. If they're just doing like kegs of milk, they don't have to pay for packaging. Isn't that way cheaper for them too? Question. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's true. There are still like milk bottles that come in glass, and glass is a lot easier to recycle. To recycle glass, we don't have to ship it to China, like we, we probably do for most of it. But you melt it down, and make new glass stuff. Um, the United Kingdom is starting to do milk men. They're like thinking about implementing milk men again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of my old he friends from high school, like ten years ago, would lived in Utah, and like I don't know, like, maybe it's a more of a Utah thing. Um, <laughs> but he was a milkman too, like ten years ago. So, it, like, some places are doing that, and I don't know how much more, like, does that reduce carbon emissions, or, like, does having a dude drive around and deliver milk cost more carbon dioxide? I, I don't know. It's probably better, at least in terms of waste. Uh, so there's different solutions, and, and kind of the, the gist is you have to try different things. But the UC system has implemented a rule for themselves where all UCs have to be zero waste by, did I write it down? No. Uh, I think 2020, but it might be 2030. I think it's 2020, though. So at UCI, I, I know those numbers. Like five years ago, they were at 90% zero waste. So they all 100% the, of the stuff that they threw out, think about like your trash can, 100%. They reduced that down by 90%. They were only throwing away 10% of the stuff anymore. But what's that 10%? That's the really hard things like batteries, uh, styrofoam packaging for like the chemistry lab, uh, contaminated vials again for the chem lab, uh, you know, the really difficult items. What do you do with the last 10%? I don't know. Educate the public and, and you invent stuff to do with the last 10% of waste. Um, like car batteries, what do you do with old car batteries? Some people use those to, uh, to store solar charge. So if you have a bunch of solar panels, you attach your old car batteries and they can store solar charge. Um, and now you get power at night too. Um, so things like that, just creative ideas uh, can help. Questions? Right, so yeah. what do you do with stuff like um, the necessities, toilet paper? Well, so like toilet paper is designed to biodegrade really easily. Uh, with as soon as you get toilet paper wet, you notice how it melts. It so it's designed to do that. But like those flushable wipes that are, are a fad now, those are not, and those just get stuck in the drain. If, if you put them in your toilet, they, they clog up and, and cause really expensive problems. But things like toilet paper, uh, either get a bidet or or sit like you know live with yourself. Like I use toilet paper. Um, <laughs> uh, live with yourself in that reality in that you are creating that waste and it's it's really difficult to reduce all your waste but from like a corporate perspective or a city or national perspective there are actual zero waste programs so so one of my friends geographer um, his career that he, he did was uh, he worked for a waste management company and he was a zero waste consultant and so places would hire him to like come to a company and analyze all of their waste and tell them exactly what steps to do to become zero waste. It's like, how do you do that? Hire a dude who's smart, get a geographer to help you. That's how you go zero waste. Question. about that, they have reusable toilet paper, basically cloth. And, oh. and you like, they make it into like rolls and then they like Velcro it or something weird. <laughs> that sounds fun. Sounds, really sounds like you should just get a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and Japan has bidets and literally everywhere. Yeah, and that that's a good zero everywhere. waste problem. <laughs> that's also, I assume, why a lot of like young people, you guys are kind of borderline millennial Gen Z, uh, <laughs> and and the like. The trend is most of them that you talk to say, "I don't want kids," and a big part of that. And I have, I have a small kid, just one and a half. They produce a whole ton of waste, like diapers and food and, and clothes and uh, the car seat 
that is only legal to be like to be safely used for like three years. So you can't use it for the next kid, and it's like this big wad of plastic that the government says is unsafe after the first couple of years. So like, what do you do with that? You, you're legally not supposed to sell it to the next person. Like a lot of things, yeah, you can't secondhand. Diaper, you can use reusable ones, but it also sucks. Um, and then there's just a whole bunch of waste generated with kids. So uh, yeah, there's there's that whole argument that a lot of millennials and Zers are using. You guys are mostly Z, right? Z is whatever younger than millennial. Millennial is like. Yeah, so if you were born around 2000, you're Gen Z. Or if I was born before. Then, well, so like my little brother's born in 98. He's definitely Gen Z. Um, I'm definitely a millennial. I'm like like mid to upper millennial, I think. He's 12 years younger than me. But I don't know. What, so when were you born? Yeah, you're Gen Z. Yeah. Maybe you feel like a millennial. I, I don't care. Um, <laughs> and like, <laughs> but I think Z is, millennials are supposed to be people who came of age around the year 2000. So like, I was in middle school for um, uh, Y2K, and like, people were kind of nervous about computers breaking forever. And like, you don't know what that is. You were one. You don't care about Y2K. But for us, it was like, yeah, I'm kind of nervous. Hope they fix Y2K. Yeah. Um, so that that's a good cutoff. Is like, were you, uh, were you coherent during like 9/11? Then you're probably a millennial. If you don't really remember 9/11, you're probably Gen Z, even if you were born before then. Yeah. I think that's the cutoff, unofficially. But. All right. Other questions on waste. Did you grow up with a smartphone? It's like your first phone, a smart smartphone. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, you did see. My first smartphone was a Nokia brick, and like we had to, <laughs> we had to call people. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> We're not gonna do uh, what generation wars. Even though I don't want to get them. Um, okay. Fourth aspect of sustainability and resilience. What you want to do? Let's do energy. Nobody's super excited. Energy. So we need energy. Energy is super important. Um, I'm going to divide energy sources into renewable and non-renewable. Now, all energy production has some environmental cost. But there's a lot of energy sources that are better than others in terms of environmental cost. Um, renewable sources of energy are things that don't run out. That's the definition is renewable energy means it renews, it replicates. You don't run out of it. Non-renewable simply means that it is a finite resource and you can run out of it. But also in general, renewable sources tend to have a lower environmental impact and non-renewable sources tend to have a higher environmental impact. Uh, what's your favorite source of energy? The sun. The sun, cool, okay. <laughs> uh, solar. Solar is a renewable source. Now, solar panels have, uh, have been expensive and difficult to produce, and they've uh, required a lot of rare earth minerals that have to be mined to produce, too. So to create solar panels, you do have to like, create mines, and there is an environmental impact from that. Um, but their cost and level of efficiency has improved incredibly in the last 10 years. Um, for the last... 15 years, the world leader in solar production, like solar energy production, has been 
Germany. Um, so think about that one. Germany, good at engineering, uh, kind of homogenous population, uh, wealthy, developed country. Um, but they're on that like backside of the population curve where everybody has decided not to have kids, so their population is shrinking. Um, but Germany's been the solar leader for uh, like 15 years. Is Germany a sunny place? Like you think, oh, cool, I'm going to Germany, get in a tan, better bring my bathing suit. You ever have you ever had that thought? No. No. Yeah, it's not a particularly sunny place. So you don't have to have like you know bright direct tropical sun to produce solid solar energy. You just like need a view of the south if you're in the northern hemisphere. Um, and then because Germany has produced so many solar panels, they have made it so that they're much more efficient, much more much more inexpensive to produce. So that um, they then partner with China to produce really efficient panels and, and have them be inexpensive. So now solar is much cheaper than coal um, to the point where there's no reason to use coal energy at all. Like anybody who, who wants to use coal is just being nostalgic and stupid. Um, but solar is cheaper and in the long run better for the environment and lower on carbon emissions. Questions, and in California, really easy. Uh, in California alone, we could outproduce Germany in terms of like solar production. We have much more solar potential because we're a sunnier state than Germany is, uh, and that's one out of fifty. Texas could as well. Really, the the whole like southern United States, that whole strip, uh, could could get most of their energy from solar. Um, I said Cal State Fullerton is producing too much solar now. Um, where like the Edison company is mad at them because they're not purchasing energy anymore from the Edison company. That's a good situation in terms of solar production to get into. Yeah. Do you think that uh, the sun belt could produce enough energy for the rest of the country? I don't know about for the rest of the country, but probably yeah. If if you like if you built the panels in a density that was high enough, sure. Um, realistically, would we do that? Probably not. Uh, but like, if, if you were really trying to produce energy for the whole country just using solar, you could, but I don't think we would. Yeah. Other energy sources. Wind. Wind, yeah. Wind uh, kind of has the same story as solar. Wind turbines. Wind energy has been around for a long time. Like people use windmills all over the world to like grind your wheat or corn or whatever. Um, but wind turbines now. Uh, you use the wind to spin a turbine, and that generates electricity. Um, wind turbines are still really expensive. The, like, the big modern industrial ones are huge. They're kind of scary huge. And each one costs millions of dollars. So they're very expensive. But over the lifespan, they do pay for themselves. And wind is also cheaper than coal and more efficient than coal is. So between the two, you could easily power the whole country and be much less expensive than coal. Generally, the places that uh, aren't sunny are probably windy. Pick, <laughs> pick your favorite one. Questions? But uh, who's the world leader in wind production? Also Germany, for the last like 15 years. So nobody, also nobody talks about like the, the winds of Germany. Of, oh, I'm going to Germany. Cool, bring your windbreaker. Nobody ever says that. It's not a windy place but they've been the world leader in wind production, really just because they've tried. They did the, the, the research, they paid the money to build turbines, um, and actually, really nice for the rest of the world, they built so many of both that now they're both cheap enough and efficient enough where it's a viable energy source for everyone else on Earth because they did that like first beta testing for us. Why does Germany choose to do this? Like, what? Why wouldn't we do that if we have much more? Yeah, um, they wanted to. Yeah, uh, they, well, okay, so, so Europe, smaller countries, generally more homogenous populations. So it's easier for a small country and a small population to be like politically single, more goal oriented, where you can decide to do a thing as a country much easier than, than the United States can. Um, because the United States is kind of too big. And then Europe also has really bad problems with acid rain from coal. So the coal-rich regions of Europe 
uh, are also these big basins where the coal uh, air pollution would sit in there and create acid rain. And so Germany saw like firsthand the, the negative effects of, of coal as an energy source um, and said, hey, let's do something else that makes us not get asthma. That's, that's probably why. Also, again, wealthy country with a smaller population can decide, hey, we're going to really invest in solar and wind and like stereotype of German engineering. Yeah, they probably, that probably helps a little bit too. So that's that's why. <coughs> There's probably a couple other reasons. Geothermal. Geothermal. Yeah, geothermal is another energy source. Uh, good one. So geothermal energy, of all the energy sources, this is actually the one that has the lowest environmental impact. If you can choose any energy source, geothermal is the best. But the problem with geothermal is you need a volcano to do it. Like you need active volcanic activity nearby in order to do geothermal energy. Um, so Hawaii is the leader in the United States for, for probably per capita production because Hawaii is a bunch of volcanoes. Um, globally, uh, Iceland does uh, is, is like 99% or, or very close to 100% geothermal because Iceland is also made of volcanoes. Um, but the way that you use geothermal activity is near volcanoes, uh, if you have like a geyser or hot springs, then that is water that's heated up by uh, magma close to Earth's crust. Okay, so you take that water, water uh, generates steam, and you, you put a cap on your hot spring, essentially, and use that steam to spin a turbine, that makes electricity, that's all. all you, how do you make electricity in general? You make something spin a wheel, and that's it. That's electricity generation. So like wind does it, geothermal does it, hydro, same thing, you spin a wheel somehow. You need something to spin the wheel for you, like the wind or steam spinning a wheel. Um, and so you just capture that steam in geothermal, make it spin a wheel, uh, and then usually we purify it and inject it back into the ground, and it heats up again and, and does the same thing. So it's like a, it's a closed system. It's super clean. There's no carbon generated, carbon emissions generated, besides building the plant for it, but that's kind of a one-time cost. So if you have the option, this is the best way to go. But like we're, I, we probably shouldn't, knowing people, we probably shouldn't start drilling into the ground like, yeah, let's make more volcanoes then. <laughs> this seems like a bad plan. Questions? Hmm. Next, other, other energy sources. Hydro? Uh, hydro? Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. What would you say? Hydro. Oh, yeah, hydro. Yeah. Hydro. Now, um, of the renewable sources, hydropower is one of the more controversial. Um, hydropower uh, can be generated a couple different ways. Typically, the way that people generate hydro is, um, in, in like current times, is you build a dam on a river, and that dam holds back water, and then you let a little bit of water through the dam, and it spins a wheel for you, just like the others do. Uh, and that generates electricity. And that's very efficient. Like, you're, not, you're just holding back some water. Now, dams have a whole bunch of benefits for people. They also have a whole bunch of negative environmental impacts that, that probably outweigh the benefits. But, like, modern society, modern California kind of needs dams to exist. So, the benefits. Uh, dams generate electricity. Uh, did I write it down? No, I didn't. Uh, California's uh, water storage system, our reservoirs, generate uh, like half of the state's electricity. You don't write that number down, but it's some extraordinary amount of energy for the state uh, that's generated by our water reservoirs. So we have reservoirs all over the state that's hold, holding water for us to drink. We let up a little bit of water out at the time, that generates electricity, and it generates a whole bunch of electricity. Um, so dams do that. They also hold water for us so we can drink it in dry seasons. That's really nice. And then they also control floods. That's nice too. 
So those are really good reasons to have dams around. And if you live in LA, you need dams to survive. And if LA needs, if LA wants to survive, we need dams. But dams, as a negative environmental impact, um, they they trap sediment from rivers that would otherwise uh, nourish topsoil. So dams kind of kill farming. They, the dams make it so that you must use uh, artificial fertilizers and, and soil nutrients that a river would otherwise put onto your, your farm. Uh, and then dams interrupt fish migration and, and really just destroy ecosystems. So if you like salmon, you don't like dams. If you like eating fish, you don't like dams. But you also live in Calif in LA, so you must have dams. So like it, it's it's a we don't we're not at a, a solution for this yet and right now we must have dams to live. But in rainy places like Oregon, Washington, uh, they have a lot of dams for energy production, but they're destroying like salmon migrations and so there's a big push to destroy or re remove dams in like Oregon and Washington um, and replace them with uh, smaller turbines along the way of a river, micro turbines? I, I don't really understand. So um, how does like the energy get stored? Is there like a machine that like... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, well, no. I, like, I've taken tours of these dams okay. uh, and, and I have pictures of the turbines, but inside the dam, like it's a big concrete structure. It's amazing, giant concrete structure. You have a, a, a section that lets a little bit of water through from that reservoir above, and it lets it through the dam, and that water spins these massive turbines that are the size of this classroom. And when you spin that, it does, it, electrical engineers, it does magic, because uh, nobody in here is an electrical engineer, makes the, the turbine spins, and that generates electricity, and then that electricity goes out to the power grid. That power grid uh, then goes to different power stations and then to your house. Oh, so it's all connected? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, I was wondering like where, like, yeah. Yeah, okay, so, so, so coming out of a dam, if you ever drive up close to a dam, there's power lines going all over the place from it. That's the power gener generated by the dam. And then like California uh, reservoirs, they can actually let water out of the dam, generate electricity, and then they'll pump it back into the reservoir and keep doing it again, with, and it's like it's still efficient. That's kind of cool. Uh, okay, other energy sources. Did you know hydro in the ocean? Did I didn't. Uh, <laughs> dams, turbines. So ocean hydropower is kind of like a river hydropower, where you can put underwater turbines. Uh, out in the ocean, and uh, usually tidal energy will spin those turbines. So when the high tide comes in, spins a turbine. Um, it doesn't work both ways. So when the tide goes out, it doesn't spin the turbine. But when the tide comes in the second time, two high tides each day, then it spins it again. Some of them are wave energy. Um, these are also really expensive. They're kind of as expensive as, as wind turbines are, uh, but they're very common off the west coast of Europe. Uh, United States doesn't have very many. Okay, others. So, wastewater treatment plants. Some of them, how they do that to make the cakes. And it's potential energy. And oh, they burn them. Uh, fine. <laughs> Biofuels. <laughs> okay. So, biofuels is another big category. Biofuels includes just trees. So like people that, that chop down trees and burn it for firewood and use that to keep your house warm and like run your stove, that's like non-industrial people do that. Uh, that's still a huge portion of people on earth. And for the bulk of human existence, this has been our form of energy for cooking and heating. It's just biofuel forest stuff. Yeah. Did you also turn to like gasoline? Uh, yeah, you can gasify wood. I'm not, that one's not really widely used, but yeah, it's possible. Um, yeah? Ethanol. Yes, ethanol. So ethanol uh, is a form of fuel that's made out of, out of different uh, plant sources. Uh, in the United States, in the like 
mid 2000s we made it out of corn. Uh, that one ended up being really inefficient and harmful uh, to like global food industry. So U.S. government gave a big tax subsidy to corn farmers. Corn farmers like, cool, we'll vote for you. Um, so they grew all this corn, and then they used that corn to make ethanol fuel. Um, and like you'll see gas stations that have E85, ethanol E85. That's, that's corn fuel. Um, when that happened the global price of corn increased. Uh, corn, tortilla, corn tortilla prices increased so that like, people actually went hungry around the world who, who subsist on corn tortillas. Um, and then you have this negative environmental impact where you're using the land to grow energy. You're using topsoil, you're using water, you're using nutrients, fertilizers, all this stuff to grow energy. That ends up being way less efficient than like any other energy source. So, so the amount of product that you're putting into growing corn uh, negates any energy that you get out of the corn. So that corn thing, uh, the only people that benefited was like corn farmers and senators. Um, the better biofuels, you can make biofuel out of, out of lots of stuff, fryer oil, grease, um, but the best one is algae. You can bioengineer algae really easily you don't need much to grow algae. You just need like a little bit of water and sunlight and some nutrients and you can grow algae. And so we can uh, bioengineer algae to be a really efficient source of ethanol, ethanol fuel. So like if you've got to go ethanol biofuel, algae is the answer. Uh, and corn was, let's get the scan. Okay, non-renewables. Coal, oil, Natural gas. Nobody named these. <laughs> like, were you thinking about these and just didn't nuclear. want to? Yeah, nuclear, awesome. Okay, so all of these, I don't want to spend our remaining 10 minutes just talking about energy. Um, cool oil, natural gas, we already talked about how these uh, put carbon dioxide <laughs> from the fossil fuel category as a carbon reservoir into the atmosphere. Uh, these are the main causes of carbon-related climate change. Uh, burning these puts extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Atmosphere absorbs more heat and traps it in sites for, so we heat up. Um, these are also all finite sources. We're going to run out of them. So even if coal, oil, and natural gas were not harmful in terms of climate change, like if, if we figured out a way to capture all the carbon dioxide from coal, OK, that's clean coal. Uh, the U.S. tried that again in the like late 2000s. It was expensive and didn't work, and it, it was really just a pilot project that the coal companies decided, eh, this is too hard, we're not going to do it. So clean coal doesn't exist. It was a project, it was an experiment that failed, and anyone who talks about clean coal doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, we're also going to run out of it at some point, and it gives you asthma if you live near a coal power plant. Great. Uh, oil, we're also going to run out of that eventually. Um, we should probably stop using it for our cars as soon as possible. Um, because we use oil to get to space. Like, we make rocket fuel out of oil. And, like, you know, if, if you like space, then we need oil and we need to save oil for space stuff. Um, now, that's not the best argument for switching your car to, to not oil burning. But that's a pretty good one. Um, and then we also talked about on Tuesday already how, how uh, like container ships, shipping cargo ships, uh, burn a lot of oil and cause a lot of carbon emissions that way. Natural gas does burn more efficiently than coal and oil. Uh, it produces less carbon, less particulate matter, so it's better in that respect. But the way that we mine natural gas is through a process called fracking that we don't have enough time to talk about. Uh, but it essentially poisons groundwater, makes it so you can't drink water. Uh, there's probably 10 documentaries on that, go watch one, with like a bunch of alcohol, probably. Uh, <laughs> a responsible amount. Um, nuclear energy uh, is technically non-renewable because we do mine materials for it, and uh, so we, we get uranium, plutonium, nuclear reactive metals. Uh, we have to mine those. And then you uh, put them in a nuclear power plant. Those are also very expensive to build. 
Uh, it's a lot of concrete that goes into a nuclear power plant, and concrete, turns out, also produces a whole bunch of carbon dioxide. Concrete is one of the, like, producing that is one of the leading sources of carbon dioxide emissions in the world. And nuclear power plants cost a whole bunch of concrete. But to run a nuclear power plant, it's kind of easy. I mean, we have, we've got it figured out. Uh, not easy for my, me or you. Um, but you, uh, you start a nuclear reaction, use water to control the reaction so it doesn't get too hot. And then that reaction makes the water heat up so it produces steam. That steam spins a turbine. So it's really just people forcing the same thing as geothermal. Like nuclear is humans' technology version of geothermal energy. Once nuclear is going on, it, it works pretty well. It doesn't produce very much carbon once you have the nuclear power plant built and the, the metals mined. But then there's also nuclear waste. What do you do with the waste? Yeah, good question. Uh, bury it. Ask China to hold it for us. Pay China to hold it for us. Um, one senator wanted to, to, U.S. senator wanted to drop it to the bottom of the ocean. That's how you make Godzilla. <laughs> like, I think that's canon. Um, probably what, like, our long-term goal for nuclear waste uh, well, okay, so the U.S. Navy uses nuclear power for their subs. Their plan is when it gets cheap enough to go to space, they're just going to ship it into space. That's their plan. Why? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that cool? So, so we don't, that, that basically means we don't have a good plan for nuclear. But, like, we're holding it underground until somebody comes up with something. That's nuclear waste. That's you eventually Spinning, spinning a turbine? Or just spinning in general, do yeah. natural disasters cause electricity? Uh, like a hurricane? Tornado or hurricane. Well, no, be, so like you have to, you have to control that and, and have it spin a turbine to oh. generate electricity. So like anything that spins, yeah, we could use anything that's, right. I, I spin, right. can I be electricity? <laughs> um, no, so like a natural disaster, that's a good question. Um, a, a hurricane or tornado would be too fast and too unpredictable to reliably use as electricity. So like, okay, hurricane's coming. Cool, it's going towards our wind turbines. This is great. We're going to get a whole bunch of electricity. No, probably it's, it, the winds are way too fast. So most turbines are set for like a, a specific speed range. Hurricanes are probably three to ten times that. Uh, proper range and it just breaks them all. And like if you know a hurricane's coming, well, you don't build wind turbines where there's hurricanes. Like that's that's kind of wasting your money. But if you knew a hurricane was coming, you'd probably go out and take all the, the blades off the turbines and like hold them and hope the hurricane didn't wreck them all. Because that's like many, that would be many billion, 